Father, um, Father, we are grateful for a gift that we often take for granted, and it's just the gift of good health. Lord, it's seldom, at least for me, that I wake up and I praise you that my lungs are just clear. My throat is clear, my mind being clear. It's not often that I think to praise you for those things. Yet, Lord, it's so frequent that I come to you when I'm sick and when things are not right. And within me, Lord, I need a recalibration of that. I need to be coming to you and thanking you when, when we're healthy, when we're strong, and coming to you when I am broken and sick. And Lord, uh, this last week in particular, that, that cold bug, uh, sneezing and coughing and congestion has just hit a lot of people. And because of the season of life that we're in with the realities of, uh, of viruses, uh, many of us are just want to stay away <laughs> when we're like that. And we, we, we praise God that they have an awareness to not get others sick. But Lord, I, I ask that you would bring healing to them. I ask that they would feel better today, that they would feel well enough to praise you in the midst of their sickness. And I think that that's a, a fitting picture for us, that though we may come into this place this morning broken and tired and hurting and bitter, maybe angry, our souls are not calibrated well to you in many respects, and we, t and we tend to use that as an excuse not to praise you. We tend to use that as a, a rationale for not engaging in our spiritual uh, disciplines and in, 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 in fostering and cultivating our relationship with you. And Lord, those things are no excuse. Those things are no excuse oftentimes because we're healthy enough to do other things. And so, Lord, would you, those of us who are hurting and, and tired this morning, would you give us, would you give us the strength to praise you? Would you recalibrate our mind to think rightly about you? For those of us who have come in here angry, had a hard morning, would you reorient our minds on your word? For those of us who have even come in here maybe reluctantly, those who may be watching online reluctantly, yet they feel compelled by you to do so, would you call out to them today, Lord, through your word and through the, the singing of your word? Would you grab hold of their soul and draw them to you, Lord, that they would worship you, that they would praise you despite how they feel, that they would command themselves bl to bless you, O oh, our soul, and that they would find rest and peace and joy in praising you. Even at times, Lord, we don't feel like praying. When we do, we almost never regret the time we, spent, time we invested in you. And so, Lord, I pray that this morning would be that. That however these souls came in here, that they leave here full of the Spirit, ready to engage you, ready to recalibrate their souls to be in line with you. Fill us up, Lord. Lord, just stick your pinky finger in this place. That's all we need. We can't take all of you. Lord, just, just, put a, just stick your, the power of your, the phalange of your finger in this place, Lord, and we will praise you. Your presence will overwhelm us. Just, 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 just give us a, a, a short audience with you. And would your word do its work? In Christ's name, we thank you and pray. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, good morning, guys. Um, if you look on your bulletin, you'll see two QR codes. The top QR code is a cross-reference sheet for this Sunday sermon. The bottom QR code, if you have kids, are what the kids are going to be going through today at Children's Church. Uh, so if you want to follow along with cross-references, I use a lot. We use scripture to interpret scripture. And there's a lot of scripture oftentimes on Sunday. And so feel free to pop out your phone. Highlight the QR code, and it's going to be verses. It's a lot of verses because, you know, we're going to use the text. Sometimes the Lord blesses and gives me verses that are not there. 
type them in, write them down. Uh, and sometimes there are verses that are there that I don't end up using. Just have them, put them in your pocket. But those verses are a good thing to go to throughout your week as you reflect on the things taught on Sunday morning. Amen. This, uh, my name is Pastor Kanan, uh, one of the pastors here at Pillar. And for the next five weeks now, this week included, we're going to be finishing and continuing a series called The Six Basics. Last week, we started The Six Basics. The Six Basics are basically six basic benchmarks or six basic disciplines that every Christian should practice. Six things that we think would be beneficial to you in your walk with the Lord Jesus. After we're done with this six basic series, this is a topical series, we're going to walk through the book of Galatians. And that's going to be, that's going to be ooh so delicious. So y'all don't want to miss it. I'm excited. I'm so excited about that. Last week, uh, we started with uh, this concept of enjoying God. That was the first thing we looked at in the six basics. This week, we're going to look at something called regular repentance. We'll follow that up with Christian family, bold evangelism, spiritual formation, and community engagement. And if you're a member here at Pillar Church, then those six basics are somewhat familiar to you because they're in your membership booklet. And we went over that in the membership class. But if you're not a member at, at Pillar Church, then you may, maybe have not ever heard of these six basics. And we hope that the sermon series will help lead you closer to Jesus and each other. And my prayer is that it would do that. And so this morning, we're going to look at regular repentance. You can go ahead and open in your copy of God's Word to Matthew chapter 3. Though we won't stay there at all, but go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 3. As soon as we open up the New Testament, right, that's why we're starting in Matthew 3. The second we open up our New Testament, we're hit in the face with this concept called repentance. It's literally one of the first things you see when you open up your New Testament. You see this concept of repentance. John the Baptist comes roaring onto the scene and he says these powerful words in Matthew chapter 3 in verse 2. Look what he says. He says, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Some of you have heard those words, repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? Jesus does it in Matthew chapter 4. Don't flip there, you're not going to keep up. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus continues to preach this message of repentance. He says this, from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. Following John the Baptist and following Jesus, we see the apostles in the early church continuing this same thread, this same message in Mark 6, 12 and in Acts 2, 38, where they say, repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you've got to start asking the question, besides what you think you know about the concept of repentance, what is this thing? What is repentance? What does that word mean? It's an antiquated word. It's an old word. You don't walk out on the block and hear people talking about repent. You only hear that in the church. What is it? What is repentance? And why does it have to be regular? Well, this morning we're going to look at these three concepts. We're going to look at what is repentance, why repentance needs to be regular, and then what does repentance look like? Because I think sometimes we think we've repented when we're really just remorseful. That's the reality for most of us. And we're remorseful. I'm getting ahead of myself preaching that point already. We're remorseful because we've been caught. If we had never been caught, we would have never been remorseful. We would have felt a little bad about it. But it wouldn't have hurt our soul. That's not repentance. So we start off with this first one. What is repentance? First of all, if you need just a one phrase, not a definition, but a, a posture, repentance is the posture of faith. Faith produces repentance. Faith produces repentance. When God opens your eyes and he grants you the gift of faith, repentance is a posture and a response that you have to God's saving grace for you. Repentance is a posture. It's not just a moment in time. When we're seeking to figure out what a biblical word means, we always want to go to the Bible first to see if there's any biblical definitions in the text. And if you look in your cross-reference sheet in Acts chapter 3, verse 26, we have a great starting point. Again, it's at the very beginnings of the early church, of the apostles' messaging. This is what they say. And, and, and here, it doesn't have the word repent, but it gives the definition of what repentance is. In Acts chapter 3, verse 26, in your cross-reference sheet, it says this. God raised up his servant and sent him first to you to bless you. But this is how he blesses you. To bless you 
by turning each of you from your evil ways. Okay, that just summarized this concept of repentance for us. He sent him first, he sent Jesus to bless us. How does he bless us? By turning us from our evil ways. The act of turning is a key ingredient to this concept we call repentance. The word for repent, metanoao, literally means to perceive a reality and to make a change or a shift as a result. That's what repentance means. To perceive a reality, it has to happen in this order. Perceive a reality and then make a change or a shift as a result. Repentance means to turn, y'all. It means to recalibrate. It means to make a move. And the move that God wants us to make is away from sin and toward God's son. Okay, that's, that's what it, he wants us to make a move away from sin and toward God's son. So far, I haven't said anything you don't know. It's an intentional turn from sin to the Savior, to turn from unbelief to belief. It turned from the old and, and, toward the new and the better. But repentance is turning from trusting yourself in all other things and trusting Jesus for all things. I want to show you another biblical example of, of what repentance looks like. Look in your sheet, cross-reference sheet, Acts chapter 26, verse 18. Listen to the turning language in that passage. Acts chapter 26, verse 18. He says, I am sending you to them. This is Jesus speaking to Paul. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes, right? Perception. Y'all remember it's perceived reality and then you make a change or a shift as a result. To open their eyes, right? Perceive first so that they can what? Turn from darkness to light. And then he says, and again, from the power of Satan to God. There's two times that I want you to turn from the power of darkness to light. I want you to turn from the power of Satan to God. Why? That they may receive the forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. When Jesus, the apostles and prophets call men and women everywhere to repent, they're calling us to forsake our sin and everything we placed our trust in and to place our ultimate confidence in Jesus. Concept we know, but here's the problem with theological concepts. They rarely make it to our hearts. That's the problem with theology. It stays academic, but good theology starts in the head, it moves to the heart, and it moves your hands to action. That's how you know you come to grasp a concept. You come to truly embrace a truth of the scriptures. When it starts here, it changes you here, and then it impacts you here, and you can no longer ignore it in good conscience, and it makes your hands and your feet do something. That's good theology. Then, if it doesn't do that, it's, it's not helping. You didn't fully really grasp it. Most of us have a hard time not being the captain of our own raggedy ship. In reality, not here. And here we're all faithful Christians. Jesus is my leader. I follow G, right? That's us, that's us here. We're all there here. Some of us, maybe even, starting to tickle in the here where you're like, yeah, Jesus, Lord, I feel him. And you sing, you know, well, worthy of all my praise, right? You're willing to give that much. But sometimes it doesn't trickle out into our everyday actions. Remember, good theology starts here, it goes here, and it comes out of here. If it doesn't, you haven't grasped it. You're just like a piece of it. I want you to consider yourself and think through this reality. Are you the captain of your own raggedy ship? Or have you handed over the helm to Jesus for real? That the hard, one of the hardest things in the Christian faith is to die to self and to do what God wants you to do, even in the, especially when it's something that you don't want to do. When God calls us to be faithful to something and then we don't want to do it, that's hard. When God wants us to speak to somebody, maybe to share the gospel with somebody, and we don't want to do it, that's hard. When the scriptures tell parents not to provoke their children to anger, it's hard. Because we feel like they're, they deserve our wrath. We'll get into that in a minute. Ultimately, we have to stop functioning as our own God. And finally and truly let Jesus, let God be God in our lives. It's going to be the hardest thing for you to do and be. It's to functionally, not academically, 
believe that God is God, but functionally live your life as God is God. You know how I know it's hard? Because most of us don't even know what God has said in order to do. We don't even know what his will is. We off asking everybody else, what you think? We calling Dr. Phil, can you help me figure out my life? But we have not invested time with God long enough to have the mind of Christ and a heart after God's heart to do what he's called us to do. Instead, we're looking for everything else to fulfill and tell us what to do. Which means you have academically understood the concept of God being God, but it has not gone from your heart to your hands where you're willing to go, Lord, I'm yours, do what you will with me. Hard. Hard. This is in the world of repentance. Beloved, you don't pray as you ought because you believe that you're in control. Think about, so we start talking about prayer, right? That's when people, because we're naturally self-sufficient. I'm preaching to me, y'all. Don't, <laughs> it ain't you, it's me. We're self-sufficient. You think you can, so you don't depend on power to do. That's why my prayer this morning was, Lord, I don't even praise you when my lungs is working. I don't make my lungs and my heart work. I'm the recipient of grace. Period. But we're functionally self-sufficient. We don't pray because we believe we have power to do. You don't read because you, have the, because you believe you have the ability to figure out. It doesn't matter what God said, I'm going to figure this mug out. You don't have a dependence on God because you are God. And you depend on yourself to get it done. I'm guilty. I know y'all guilty. Uh, you go through your season, your five minutes of praise God, what do you want with my life? Oh, Lord, you told me to do it. I did it. I feel good. Pat myself on the back. And then you go back to being your God because that's comfortable. That's what you know. That's what I do. That's what we do. Some of us stay in a perpetual state of low-grade depression because we functionally replace God with ourselves. There's some of us in, in a functional, low-grade depression because we're tapping into an insufficient power to fill our soul. We tap into ourselves, right? We don't heed unto God because we believe that we are God. We say, prayer, we say that prayer doesn't work. We say that reading doesn't satisfy. And, and I want to call you, beloved, this morning to do something. I want to call you to repent of that. Repent of that, whatever degree in which that applies to you, not academically repent, no. Not even feel it in your heart, it's gooey and booey that you got to repent, no. I want it to go from here to here to here. Beloved, the scriptures scream, repent, recalibrate, move, perceive where you truly are, and to make a turn or a shift to where God wants you to be. Prayer has power not because we pray, but because the one we pray to has power. Reading fills our soul and our mind, not because reading is fundamental, but because Jesus says, you shall live by every word that comes from my mouth. Some of us this morning are this. We're looking for the clouds to open and for God to speak to us before we make moves. When all you need is the book to be open for God to speak for you, to speak to you. Truly in your heart, consider, are you functionally your own God? In what areas are you truly your own God? See, on Sundays, we give it to God, at least from 10 to, 10 to 12. And then we go back to functionally being our own deity. I want to call you to what the text calls you to, to turn from your state of affairs, to, to entrust yourself to Jesus, to stop expecting, oh, I'm glad I wrote that. That's for me. Stop expecting a different spiritual result when you do the same old thing. A lot of us have an aspirational desire to be close to God. You want to be intimate with the Lord. You want to grow in your knowledge of the scriptures. Yet we do the same old thing we always done, and then we wonder why we don't grow. We wonder why we're not more intimate. Is that you? Is that just me? Come on, don't leave me on that. It's you too. We do the same thing hoping to grow, but there's no growth. That's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing in the same way at the same time and expecting a different result. Doesn't happen that way. I want to give you these words, Acts chapter 8, verse 21 through 23. It says, your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray. Pray to the Lord 
that if possible, your heart's intent may be forgiven. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by wickedness. That's God telling you, repent. If you are functionally your own God, your duty at this point is to repent. What is repentance? It's turning from sin to, and turning from yourself unto Jesus. And then the question, the second question is, why does repentance have to be regular? Here's why. Because Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, if you're using your CBR journal, like we, we send out, we still send out reminders that of your reading. Nahum, we read chapter 1 a couple uh, days ago. And Nahum chapter 1, verse 3 says this. Listen to, listen to why repentance needs to be regular. It says that the Lord will never leave the guilty unpunished. Nahum 1, 3. If we are guilty of sin, beloved, that's us. God will not allow that sin to go undealt with. And he will not allow us to go undealt with. When we are not aligned with him, calibrated well with him, in a state and a posture of repentance toward him, God will deal with the sin that we commit and not give over to him. He will ultimately deal with it. Our constant sin and neglect of God will not be swept under the rug. Guys, if you've been functionally living as your own God, know that it will not be swept under the rug. Y'all know that? God will deal with it. And it's scary to think that many of us think that if we just ignore it, it goes away. Nope. Not before we're just God. Our ignoring of him, our ignoring of our sin, our oh, it'll all be good, that is not accompanied with repentance and turning back to God, that we may experience the forgiveness of our sins, as the text we read earlier said, it shall be dealt with at one point or another. And I don't want it to be dealt with, with in a harsh way by God for all eternity, if you have not repented and believed on Jesus. The scriptures say that we were born in inequity. In Psalm 50, 51, 5 and 58, 3 and Romans 5, 12 through 21, we sin regularly, and so we need to recalibrate. We need to repent regularly. Beloved, if you're a Christian here this morning, then you're going to identify with this psalm. If there's one thing that torments a true Christian, it's unrepentant sin. Listen to Psalm 32. Just let the imagery do something to you. The psalmist says, How joyful is the one whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered, how joyful is the person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity in whose spirit there is no deceit. But listen to verse three. Listen to Psalms make a shift. When I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was drained as in the summer heat. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my inequity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Stop there. Have you ever experienced that? If you're a Christian this morning, one of the most inner, one of the most tormenting realities is unrepentant sin. And I ask you this, if you don't have inner turmoil over the sin that you commit, I want you to question whether or not you truly believe that your sin is sinful in the sight of God. you have the heart of God, sin hurts. It's that sin that you commit that was crucified on the cross of that Savior that you say you, you, you worship. Beloved if, if, beloved, if sin doesn't torment your soul, when you're seriously disconnected from God. And if that's you, I want you to just eat that. If your sin does not torment you internally, you are seriously disconnected from God. You just are. And if your soul is tormented by sin, then you identify with that psalmist that your bones feel like they're wasting away until you confess that sin. Get that, get that before God. If you want to feel the burden of your sin be lifted off your shoulders, all you must do is repent and believe and but repent and believe that all that repent and believe of what I wrote this. I'm going to say this. Repent and believe what is true about God is true. This is what it says in Colossians 2. 
that on the cross, Jesus died to erase the sin debt of all who turn from their sins and trust in Jesus. If you want to feel the weight of your sins come off of your shoulders, confess those sins, repent, which means to perceive your reality, turn, make a shift as a result, and give that sin unto the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him not only to forgive your sins, but to grant you grace and growth and intimacy with him. Isaiah 55, 6-7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will freely forgive. Beloved, I want to call you to this. If you... If your sin is not causing you to... If your sin is not causing inner turmoil, I want you to... Perceive, I want you to Consider the reality that you don't know God. I don't care if you grew up in church. I don't care if you help, if you're one of the founding members of this church. If your sin does not cause a rift in your soul, there's a possibility that you don't know God. And I'm calling you as the text to repent of that reality, repent of your sin, stop being your own God, and trust in Jesus to make you right with the true and living. That's my desire. I don't care if you leave after this. And you like us or like this place. But if you know God, if you believed on Jesus, that's a win for your soul for all eternity. Amen. Don't have the pride in believing that you can't in front of these people. You, you, you played Christian in front of these people all this time. Bump that. If you die today and you played Christian, you go to hell. But if you confess your sin and trust on Jesus and, and trusted and trusted your life in Jesus Christ, though everybody here calls you a hypocrite, you are made one with God and you are right with the Father through the blood of the Son and the work of the Spirit is in you. I don't care what anybody else thinks about. If that's you, eat it and don't care who sees. Don't care who's watching. Don't care what your mama and sister them think. Today is the day. The text says, seek the Lord while he may be found. There will come a time when your life will end. And that time is now over. And you're not seeking the Lord for salvation. You're enduring the payment of your sin in accordance with God's justice. You're paying it instead of the Savior. This is why the text calls all men everywhere to repent. All women everywhere to repent. Turn from being your own God. Turn from your sin. Stop trusting in yourself. You're not okay with God. Everyone here needs to repent, including me. Why does repentance have to be regular? Because we sin regularly and we desire to be clean and have a strong connection with God. But now the question is, what does repentance look like? Repentance can look different, a little different for each person. And that's because it can be triggered by different things according to the text. If you look in your cross reference sheet, you'll see a whole list of scriptures. Repentance can be triggered by the fear of judgment. It can trigger that, right? Repentance can be triggered by the fear of judgment. Repentance can be triggered by being overwhelmed by God's kindness, right? That first one was Matthew 3. The second one is Romans 2. Repentance can be triggered by grief, 2 Corinthians 7. Repentance can be triggered by bad circumstances, Luke 15. Repentance can be triggered by suffering, 1 Peter 4. Repentance can be triggered by God's call to be holy, 1 Peter 1. Depending on how God opens your eyes to see your need for the Savior, your repentance will look different in accordance with how he done it. But there are three marks of true repentance that are always present no matter the circumstances around how God opens your eyes to realize that you have a need to repent. These three are always the same. The first is, and I'll walk through these, the first is self-awareness. The second is a, bro a broken heart, a.k.a. conviction. And the third is proof of repentance. Firstly, genuine repentance will always come with, self, with the self-awareness reality check. Remember what repentance is. Remember, it starts with the perceived reality, 
that causes you to make a shift or a turn as a result. Before one repents, God graces us by showing us where we truly are and where we need to be. You guys remember when God asked Adam that, that ominous question in Genesis chapter 3, where he said, Adam, where are you? Genesis 3, 9. You know that question wasn't because God didn't know where Adam was. God's desire, he was gracing Adam and showing him where he was by asking him, where are you? God wanted Adam to know where he was. The con- and not where he was physically, spatially, where he was spiritually. At that point, Adam had been the captain of his own raggedy ship. He had trusted in his own desires and he sinned against God. And now he's far from God, distant from him spiritually. And God says, Adam, where are you? Adam's mind stays, I'm I'm, I'm over here. Surely after a moment, Adam's like, yeah, I'm far from you. That's where I am. I'm jacked up. That's where I am. That's what I am. Repentance always starts with self-awareness. Beloved, this is real in our own realities, too. Have you ever found yourself in a bad situation, and then you start asking yourself that question internally? You're like, man, where am I right now? What am I doing here right now? You ever caught yourself midway through a sinful act? Let me say that again, because the answer is yes. Have you ever caught yourself midway through a sinful act? And that thing starts talk, something starts to talk, what am I doing right now? What am I what am I doing right now? You ever been sitting alone, about to do something stupid, and God interrupts you by saying, My child, what are you about to do? Don't do that. You're all alone. Yet God's kindness is to bring awareness to your mind. You ever been for the, for the parents in the room, have you ever been disciplining your kids and midway through the discipline, you're like, I'm going overboard. That's me. I'm, go, oh, I'm going overboard. Too much, too much, too much, too much. But you're in the midst of it. And you don't want to relent because you want to be the captain of your own ship. But God has graced you to say too much. You're sitting all alone and you're in the midst of that sin and you want to follow through because it's going to pleasure you. But something, someone is telling you, my son, my daughter, stop. 1 Corinthians 10 comes alive where it says, no temptation to seize us that's not common to man. But God is faithful, will always provide a means of escape. And if you've ever been in the midst of sin, or you've been in the, in the, the preparatory stages of committing sin, there has almost always been an escape for you. A phone call, a knock at the door, a, a reality check of where you are right now. Something has happened to stop you, to allow you out of this situation. We need to choose to ignore God or to repent. We can do what we want to do or we can turn. There's only two options at that point. That's the, that's, that's the point of, what is it, the point of the crux, the point of no return, I don't know what to call it. That's it right there. That's the pivot point. You can turn or you can sin. What you want to do? Some of us look at our lives and I've done this, where you kind of look back and you're like, man, what did I do with my life? Because it all starts with, you know, you look back and you're like, man, I wasted a day last week, man. I could have got, I wasn't as productive. And then you look back and you're like, oh, man, I wasted a week. And then you look back and you find out I wasted that month. And then I, if you're like me, there came a time where I was like, man, I wasted three years of my life. And before you know it, you're thinking you don't wasted your whole life. Where are you this morning? God has provided this time and this space to open your eyes to the reality of your situation. And so my question is the same question that God asked Adam. Where are you? Not where you're physically located, but I want you to think, where are you with him? Are you far from God or are you intimately an intimate relationship with him? Are you somewhere in between? Where are you? And then I want to ask you this question. Where does God want you to be? You don't just turn for the sake of turning. You're turning toward where God wants you. And so where are you? And then where does God want you to be? Are you far from God like Adam? Are you a self-proclaimed Christian, but you're functionally an atheist? Where are you? Where are you? And then what I want you to do, I want you to eat it. Because that's where you are. The hardest, thing, the hardest thing to do is to rightly evaluate for ourselves where we are. So I want you to spend time with God Asking him, Lord, where, where, where am I with, with you? 
This is real. This is tangible theology. This is academically I know I'm at. My heart's broken. Now, where, Lord, where, where am I? Help me find myself. You don't find yourself by looking inside. There's nothing good in there. You don't find yourself by going to the wilderness. You get lost out there. You find yourself by God helping you show you where you are with him. Where am I? Where am I, Lord? I need help. Open my eyes. Read the Psalms. Read the New Testament. Let him show you where you are. And then you recalibrate. You repent. You turn to where he wants you to be. It can be incremental, but the turn just has to be, you just have to be shifting. You're ever in a posture of shifting and turning. That's your life. That's my life. Firstly, what does he do? He opens your eyes to perceive reality. That's the first thing that comes with every time somebody repents. That's the first thing. Their eyes are open. First thing. Second thing, God graces us by breaking our hearts. And not just over the sin, but we broke our hearts that we sinned against him. It's called conviction. The affections we have for God are never stale in light of our sin. When you recognize that it was your sin that crushed your Savior on the cross, you can't be callous about it. Here's something about repentance. Repentance is never merely an outward extension uh, outward uh, ex- uh, expression of grief. That's not repentance. Because you cried about it doesn't mean you repented of it. Remember I said this earlier, repentance isn't being remorseful. It's different. You can't repent without being remorseful, but you can be remorseful without repenting. Okay? You can't repent without being remorseful, but you can be remorseful but never get to repentance. True repentance makes us sensitive to hate sin as God hates sin. Proverbs 6. And what's amazing about that reality is that of our sinful condition, it torments us, but a greater reality is that God's kindness and grace breaks us down even more. If you've ever sinned against God and you hid that sin, and then when you confess that sin, right, when you're hiding that sin, you feel the weight of that sin on your shoulders, right? You feel that hurting you if you felt that. It's tormenting you. But then when you confess that sin unto God, it's almost like his grace beats us, it breaks, it breaks us down even more. You forgive me for that? Y'all remember the prodigal son? Broken because of his sin? Came back expecting just wrath from his father? And what did his father give him? Grace and mercy. I mean, he must have fell to his knees on at that point. He was already broken, but now he's on his knees and broken. Are you serious? I don't deserve this grace. It's almost better that we get justice in our, in our sick minds. Because we have this thing where we feel like we need to pay for it so it can be clean now. No, God pays for it. The father, made, the father declared, no, you righteous, my son. I took the L on your behalf. Listen to what the Lord says in Joel chapter 2. It says, this is the Lord's declaration. Turn to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping and mourning. Then he says this. This is where you get out of the the remorseful thing. He says, tear your own hearts, not just your clothes, to return to the Lord, your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. God convicts us. He shows us where we are, and then our heart breaks for what has happened. And then... After our heart is broken, we show proof of our turning, our shifting, our our shifting away from where we are toward where God wants us to be. That's why we read in in Luke 3, 8 and Acts 26, we see John the Baptist and the apostles constantly referring to the fruit of repentance. Show the fruit of your repentance. You guys heard of faith without works is dead? Repentance without works is dead too. We see the full gamut of repentance played out in the life of Zacchaeus. You guys remember Zacchaeus, the tax collector in Luke chapter 19? He had a perception of his reality because of his encounter with Jesus. His heart is broken. It started academically, hit to his heart. Then what did his hands do? I got to make restitution. That's good theology. Same thing happened with the, the prodigal in Luke 15. He became aware of where he was. God says, son, where are you? And he opened his eyes and he's eating pig food. You remember this story? He's eating pig food. He goes, what? Where am I? I need to go back to the father. I need to get back home. And then he goes home. He returns to his father expecting to pay his side of justice. But God gives him mercy. This is the imagery of, of repentance and, 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 and favor with God. 
God is willing to take back the repentant sinner. And that's why he calls all men everywhere to repent, that you may experience the forgiveness of your sins. I want to leave us this morning by reading the words of repentance from a king in the Bible named King David. I want us to read these words of his repentance after he forced himself on, an, on the wife of another man. And then he killed that man and, and some others in order to cover up that sin. And then God met him at the point of perception with a prophet named Nathan. God confronted him. That's God's grace. When God confronts you, that's grace. So God gracefully, with conviction, showed David the error of his ways and opened his eyes so he could no longer ignore his reality. And I want to leave us with the words of David in his repentant psalm. Because his bones were wasting away. Listen to what he says. This is Psalm 51. And even if you want, you can even close your eyes. Just listen to these words. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love. According to your abundant compassion, blot out my transgression. Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion and of my sin. My sin is always before me. Against you, and you alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was, a, I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self. And you teach me wisdom Deep within, purify me with hyssop and cleanse me, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will wash me, and I will be uh, wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the the let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt, God. Create in me a clean heart, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. And I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want a sacrifice or I would give it. You're not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. In your good pleasure, cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight and righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings, then bulls will be offered on your altar. Guys, we read in that psalm all the components of repentance. Perception of his reality. A heartfelt brokenness over his sin. Not that he got caught. He said, Lord, to you and you alone have I sinned. I don't care what other people think. I, I. Then he said, making me clean hands, a pure heart, turn me and there's going to be tangible fruit. I'm going to sing of your praises. I'm going to tell sinners about your repentance and your faith and your grace. And they're going to turn from their sin. Have you ever truly repented? If not, you have the opportunity to repent today. If we could close our eyes and bow our heads. I'm not going to ask anybody to come forward. I want to take away the shame that comes with a fraudulent relationship with God by having people close our eyes so we can't see you. But if you have had a fraudulent relationship with God and you believed yourself to be what you are not, and you know you are in need of grace and faith and salvation of our Lord Jesus, I need you to communicate that to God today, now. Only you know if your relationship with God is fraudulent. 
And I want you to use what we've read as your template. Ask God to give you a perception of where you truly are. Ask him to break your heart for that reality. And then you're turning, Lord. I pray that there will be fruit of repentance for them. Father, as we have our eyes closed and our heads bowed, there are men and women here who don't know you, and they spent their whole life convincing everybody around them that they do. There are men and women in here who are in bondage to their own self-deity because they don't know how to surrender unto you all that they are. There are people here who have hidden sin and their bones are actively wasting away and they're in need of the freedom, refreshing, and the joy of your salvation. There are people in here who are just plain not right with you and they need to be recalibrated, turned, shifted towards you. And there are others, Lord, who are here who have experienced recently the joy of repentance. And they've been able to to say, Lord, I am guilty of sin, but you have cleansed me. I am whiter than snow, as King David has said. And now I can experience the joy of my salvation. I can skip and hop because I am light, because there is no burden weighing me down. I've confessed the reality of my sinful ways. I don't pretend to be what I am not. I'm a broken sinner, but I'm a saint in the sight of God because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would save souls in this room by your grace, that you would grant repentance to them. Because as King David said, our flesh naturally doesn't want to repent. Our pride keeps us from acknowledging where we truly are and deceives us into thinking we're better than we are. But Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be gracious. That you would grant repentance to all who are in need of it this morning whether they're in need of salvation and to repent of their sins for the very first time, or they're in need of recalibration, repenting of their current situation that they're in, repenting of their godless, their functionally godless life. Whatever it is, Lord, I repent, Lord. I repent of my self-sufficiency. That is my biggest sin. As I sat with my daughter and my wife the other day, we even talked about besetting sins. And and when it came to my turn, it was revealed to me, self-sufficiency is where it's at. And it sickens me. So, Lord, would you grant me repentance? Teach me to depend on you. Drop me on my knees to ask you for every move, everything that I do, that I need your strength to to, to accomplish. And do it, Lord, in a gracious way, I ask. I don't want to be stubborn and catch the rod. I want to catch your grace and mercy while it is here. Lord, reveal to these people what it is that they need. And may their repentance be made regular, daily, as we are the ones who constantly recalibrate towards you. We are the repenting ones. Draw us near to you, Lord. Thank you for the gift of faith and the gift of repentance, because salvation is all of you. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.